Hello, good morning. Um, Professor uh, Rosalind, uh, Rosalind Boyd, um, and, and the title of uh, her uh, speech is uh, Neuro Rehabilitation to Optimize Neuroplasticity in Children with Cerebral Palsy. And uh, it's uh, uh, it is, I think it's uh, very, it will be very, very great lecture. So, uh, Rosaline, the stage is yours, please. Good morning in Europe and good evening in Australia. I'm in, on the north coast of New South Wales and actually at the beach. So a very different temperature. I'm sorry I'm not there in Poland. I would have loved to have been back in Poznan after my wonderful trip there a few years ago. Um, but it's wonderful to be here virtually and let's hope that we can all be together in person very soon, hopefully in Melbourne in um, 18 months time. So um, we, I have been part of a, a national center of research excellence, the Australasian Cerebral Palsy Clinical Trials Network. And we've had a vision to look at the decline in the rate and reduce severity of cerebral palsy. Our vision is to optimize neuroplasticity to improve health outcomes and to en enable full participation in society for children with cerebral palsy. Our mission has been to detect cerebral palsy much earlier, at less than six months of age, fast track children to early neuroprotectants for the brain injury and early interventions by six months of age and to conduct multi-centre trials to clinical trials to develop and test new interventions and rehabilitation methods, and to develop international clinical practice guidelines guided by a consumer network, and then transfer this new knowledge into clinical practice. The good news is that the rate of cerebral palsy is falling. And recently the Australian Cerebral Palsy Register reported that there is one in 500 children now, the previous year was one in 500 live births with cerebral palsy. There is now a one in 700 children with cerebral palsy. So this 30% reduction means that there's many children born this year who will not have cerebral palsy, making great differences for their families and for the costs and to society. So this is the latest cerebral palsy research uh, register, which is um, over the, across Australia over the last 10 years. The other great news, it, there, there has been a decrease in the severity of cerebral palsy in Australia. And now 66% of children will walk and 30, only 34% will require a wheelchair. The other good news is that there's a reduction in the rate of epilepsy and a reduction in the rate of intellectual disability. So all these factors have been come about because of all the wonderful research that's been going on around the world. And I know that there's similar trends in Europe. And this can be due to multiple factors, due to um, better maternal and neonatal care, better um, public health um, for prevention of cerebral palsy, new neuroprotectants such as magnesium sulfate and other things which are reducing the severity and rate of cerebral palsy. So we want to now optimize um, neuroplasticity to improve um, outcomes for children with cerebral palsy. And we have five, um, five themes across our CRE. And today I'm going to focus on our clinical trials and then the knowledge translation of these clinical trials into clinical practice guidelines to change um, clinical practice. We know that there has been uh, a lot of change since the international clinical practice, first international clinical practice guideline published in 2017 led by Dr. Professor Iona Novak and uh, over 40 international authors. So this has shown that early accurate diagnosis and early intervention can be undertaken. And this has been now implemented in, across many countries around the world. There is another international clinical practice guideline on early intervention for infants at risk of cerebral palsy, led by Dr. Kathy Morgan, Professor Linda Fetters and Professor Iona Novak and many other authors. And we have recently submitted for publication one on functional therapy for children with cerebral palsy. 
The great news is that these um, changes with clinical practice guidelines have now led to a European-wide um, EU Horizon grant, which looks at um, early detection of cerebral palsy and implementation of early surveillance, um, providing early intervention and family support. And this will be take under, uh, this is commenced across Italy, Holland, Denmark, Georgia, Sri Lanka, and we are undertaking this in remote and isolated families in Australia, including Indigenous Australians. There's been another wonderful paper published recently, which was an update of systematic reviews of interventions for preventing and treating cerebral palsy by Professor Iona Novak and her team, published in 2020. And we can see that there's a lot of new evidence for um, positive uh, interventions to improve uh, intervention and prevention and improve reduction spasticity management and alignment. If we look at some of the subset of interventions, we can see that there is a lot of interventions, evidence for motor interventions to improve motor outcomes. There is some interventions, um, including umbilical cord blood to improve gross motor function. There's um, <coughs> some evidence for early intervention, good interve uh, evidence from reducing muscle tone and improving contracture alignment. So there are several studies undergoing at the moment, looking at the efficacy of early intervention for infants at risk of cerebral palsy. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of these um, interventions. Though the important thing is that we want to optimize neuroplasticity and neuroplasticity being the ability of the brain to change and develop in response to input from the environment. And we've understand from all the work that's gone on in older children with cerebral palsy that in interventions need to be active, goal-directed for both motor and cognitive training because up to 50% of children can have a learning difficulty. Um, they need to be intensive, repetitive, have an incremental challenge. The child should be paying close attention and concentrating and the activity should be meaningful, sorry, um, and in an enriched environment and parent-driven. So these are the factors that we need to consider for both activity and participation focused rehabilitation. One of the first trials that we've been doing and led by um, a team in Australia, but we are looking at a comparison of baby constraint induced movement therapy and an equal bimanual training baby constraint induced movement therapy. These interventions were obviously developed by Professor Anki Eliasson and Dr. Sue Greaves and others. And the, we're comparing these two modes of early rehabilitation for children with hemiplegia. It focuses on activity-based training. And because this is two different approaches, one which is a very unimanual approach with constraint on the good arm and intensively training the hemiplegic hand in baby constraint and equal bimanual training in the um, baby bimanual training, you gain what you train. So expect that we'll have outcomes that would be likely to improve in those areas for those different alternative versions. The GAME study is incorporating goal-directed active motor training and environmental enrichment. And Dr. Kathy Morgan and her team are focused not only on the goal-orientated setting goals and intensively um, conducting motor training and cognitive challenge, but with customized home programs delivered by the parents, giving the parents education and using a coaching model. And importantly, optimizing environmental enrichment to improve outcomes for the baby. And this is delivered weekly. So the active ingredients are goal-directed active motor and cognitive training, environmental enrichment and parent coaching. The LEAP CP randomized controlled trial led by Dr. Kath Benfa undertook early surveillance of children at risk of cerebral palsy in over 800 children and conducted a randomized controlled trial, which recently concluded um, and has a novel approach using peer-to-peer -peer trainers in a low resource setting in India. It has three modules, learning, love and growth. And there's important elements here 
it incorporates both goal-directed active motor and cognitive training and where appropriate vision aware training and for all children whether they're in the intervention group or the comparison group they receive the nutrition and feeding advice from the WHO and this is incorporates a community worker who's trained by an experienced therapist to deliver the intervention in the home um, coaching the parent. So the learn module incorporates goals that might be motor goals, learning games and communication and we have very detailed sheets for the family and for the trainers to show how to set the baby up, what activities to use, what cues to use and what um, toys or other objects from the environment so that we can see that there is a um, an, a strong aspect of learning goals. We may also use vision early vision aware training where we're looking at uh, optimizing the environment for the baby with cerebral visual impairment and cerebral palsy. We're looking initially at black and white toys and then primary colors. And there's a love module, which is about mother's mental health, looking at both the family and community support and parenting acceptance and using acceptance and commitment therapy. This is very important because it's helping the parents in their sensitivity, in understanding and reading cues, their baby's cues, and being a responsive parent responding consistently and appropriately to their baby's cues. We're also involved in another randomized controlled trial with uh, Dr. Andrea Gazetta and his team in Italy. Um, and this is a multi-site trial looking at vision aware early intervention for babies at risk of cerebral palsy and with cerebral visual impairment. And the first important component is ensuring that the environment is appropriate and ideal for a baby with vision impairment. You can see the baby there with the light on the the um, toy or on the book. The book is black and white, so, and there's also a background that helps the toys to stand out in the background so that there's the objects are, are salient for the baby and they can visually grab within the environment. Also, see that there's good look, working at the focal distance for the baby on the left hand side with a black and white doll. The therapist then is teaching the mother about massage. Um, so a multimodal approach is often utilised. In another trial, the Parenting Acceptance and Commitment Therapy conducted is an online training developed by Dr. Carol Whittingham. And this is, takes the premise that parents are the infant's dose response in an enriched environment. Parents are the baby's enriched environment. And this is going to support parents to explore what matters most to them personally as a parent how to build a stronger relationship with their infant, what might be the, their goals for a rich and a more rewarding life and how to cope with the difficulties and challenges along the way when they have a child with a life, diagnosed with a lifelong condition. Next, I'm going to tell you about the new functional therapy um, clinical practice guideline, which has just recently um, been submitted for publication, led by Dr. Michelle Jackman and the team we can see there. So this is an international functional therapy guideline, looking at functional therapies um, and their approach. We looked at two systematic reviews, 29 randomized controlled trials and five before and after studies on functional therapy approaches. The, uh, we also had a broad international um, review panel and consumer engagement. So the key features of the guideline, the, the take home recommendations are that um, goals should be chosen by the client. There should be active practice during the intervention of the chosen goal. And the therapist should determine the limiting factors and practice should occur in the real world, in the real world environment. So intervention should be enjoyable and motivating for the child. Uh, there should be a high enough dose of practice need to be undertaken in order to achieve functional goals. And recently, Dr. Michelle Jackman and others published a uh, systematic review looking at the dose, required dose of upper limb intervention. And this again showed that intervention should set 
client-centred goals and involve active practice of those goals. And individual goals could be achieved with a dose of 14 to 24 hours of practice. And this either face-to-face -face and in combination with a home practice um, is, is an effective dose. A threshold dose was determined of 30 to 40 hours of practice, which improved motor ability as measured on the assisting hand assessment. And home practice appears to be a very effective supplement and good option for increasing the dose. So the important ingredients to consider here that there's a threshold dose, and again, it's goal-directed active practice. Other aspects of the guideline are that the approaches are in which the child should actively practice the goal or task in which they should, uh, want to achieve. They should be um, enjoyable and motivating. Whole task practice should be the focus. Part task practice might be required to refine the, the skill, um, but then whole task practice should be undertaken and practice should be repetitive of the task. So let's look at some of the individual therapies. For mobility outcomes, gross motor function can be improved when a goal-directed approach is used and the practice is in a real life context. And we have some great examples. So a strong recommendation for overground walking training and treadmill training. Um, a conditional recommendation for habitual and context-based therapy. We can see that there's a large number of randomized controlled trials of treadmill training and partial body weight support treadmill training. Um, two, intervention, two randomized controls, each for goal-directed training, context-focused training, sit-to-stand training, um, and habitual. And habitual and overground training showed improved walking speed and endurance. And they also looked at improvements in functional mobility and balance and changing the environmental factors could be just as effective as child-focused therapy to improve gross motor function. So in Australia, with the collaboration of Professor Yannick Blumenhoff, who developed the Habitual technique and has been running, I know, several successful camps in Europe, we have been working together with her, led by um, Professor Leanne Saksuski, um, looking at the hand-arm by manual intensive training, including lower extremity training for children with bilateral cerebral palsy, aiming to improve manual ability and motor function. This is conducted over two weeks in a day camp model with a ratio of interventionists to the child of two to one. And we have both um, experienced therapists and um, trainees. So the active ingredients are motor skill learning. The child is active all the time. Note that the hands are off, they're not being guided in the movement. Skills are being incremented. It's a very high dose and it's goal directed. Here we see the theoretical components um, in that uh, there is a goal selected. The training is intensive. Sometimes it requires some shaping. The, um, there is highly motivating, hands are off and it's a functional goal and it's constant concomitant bimanual and lower extremity postural stimulation. And then we see the Australian Habitile team. So I'm going to show you now what it looks like from the team in Brisbane.
I must say, I always get quite emotional when I watch that film, but it shows you the fantastic work going on in um, Australia with um, support of Yannick Bloemhoff and with the Habitual camps. But you can see that they're active, the hands are off, they're all, it's child active and they're learning and motivated um, and really successful outcomes, we, we hope. Um, another study that's just been completed and published in developmental medicine was by Dr. Dana Poole and the team at Perth Children's Hospital. And I think she's also going to be presenting at this conference. And this was a randomized trial comparing uh, the addition of robotic gait assisted training and whether it enhanced mobility outcomes when compared to partial body weight supported treadmill training. It's a randomized controlled trial and it focused on children with moderate to severe cerebral palsy, GMS levels three, four, and five. Um, it's a small randomized control trial. And you can see here the partial body weight support treadmill training with guided assistance of the feet on the treadmill or the robotic assisted gait training. And here we see a lovely example of a young man um, before the intervention, before doing the intensive stepping on the treadmill and overground walking and post eye stride, you can see fantastic results um, in that short period with the intensive training. One of the other recommendations from the functional therapy guideline was for hand use, a strong recommendation with low to moderate quality evidence. When a young child or person with cerebral palsy has a goal relating to hand use, goals can be achieved using goal-directed or task-specific approaches. And here we see an example from our REACH study with baby bimanual therapy and the baby constraint-induced movement therapy, two arms of the study. And we see some young infants and working with the therapist and the mother in the home environment you can see that it's activity-based training on the left, constraint on the good arm and actively using the hemiplegic hand. On the right-hand side of the screen, baby bimanual training. You note the difference with the toys, the type of toys, the um, activity that's required. So there's careful toy selection, understanding and both the cognitive components. Here we're doing some cues to encourage him to use both hands, learning to shake those rattles. So I think that gives you a really good example of all the elements in its activity-based training. There's coaching of the parent. It's meaningful to the young infant and the training is conducted in the home in context. Self-care goals can also be achieved and there's a strong recommendation with moderate quality evidence and this could include goal-directed training, the co-op approach or habitual um, to in, in, um, and can be achieved with all different subtypes and severities of cerebral palsy. So there's four randomized controlled trials of goal-directed training, two of co-op, two of context-focused therapy and two of habitual. And co-op is feasible in greater than four years of age. Habitual is feasible um, over, over six and a lower dose of co-op might be required compared to habitual to achieve success. Co-op is a cognitive orientation to daily occupational performance. It focuses on four main ingredients, skill acquisition, a cognitive strategy use, generalization and the transfer of learning. Um, and we can see here a lovely video from Dr. Uh, Hortensia Gimeno. Um, and that we can see that there's a young man learning to ride his bike. And he's, here he is before the co-op training. And this approach uses the metacognition, problem solving, goal-directed active motor training and training in context. And now we see him after the training. And I think you'll see wonderful success in learning to ride his bike independently. Very nice case. 
Leisure activities have a conditional recommendation with low to moderate quality evidence. Um, there's been one randomised control trial, Participate CP, and two co-op studies, which looked at addressing social, environmental, and uh, personal barriers, and combined with task practice. Participate CP was led by Dr. Sarah Reedman, who will be presenting about this at the conference. And this was a randomised waitlist controlled trial of motiv using motivational and behaviour change approaches to increase physical activity through meaningful participation for children with cerebral palsy. It started with goal setting, then a home environment um, visit, looking at motivational interviewing, overcoming the barriers to achieve ongoing participation in their chosen areas. It's important to consider that this is a participation focused therapy. If the, it was an activity goal, it would be Jack learning to dribble a basketball on the left, but it's a participation goal, Jack actually learning to play basketball. So there are many different factors that we need to consider to achieve um, a participation focused goal. Participate CP included the key principles of self-determination and behavior orientated approaches. It was family centered and goal directed with collaborative goal setting. It was done in context in the environment with multiple strategies, but highly individualized to the child's needs. You can see the results in the randomized controlled trial, the positive on the Copham performance. And so the participate CP is effective at improving perceived performance and satisfaction with individual physical activity participation goals. Another recent randomized controlled trial by Ellen Armstrong and team was recently been published in Developmental Medicine and is to investigate the effects of Ac Activate CP on functional outcomes in ambulant and non-ambulant children with CP compared to standard care. The theoretical underpinnings were a combination of FES cycling, adapted cycling, and goal-directed training focusing on sit to stand transfers. Children undertook three sessions per week over eight weeks, two clinic-based sessions with FES cycling and goal-directed exercises, and a home-based program once a week that focused on recreational cycling and goal-directed exercises. There was a significant improvement, and you can see there was significant and clinically meaningful improvements in gross motor function, which was retained at eight weeks post-intervention, um, greater than the minimal clinically important difference for the GMFM. There was a maintenance of effects too, not only in gross motor function, but goal performance, cycling performance. And you can see here the children participating in the Great Brisbane bike ride, improved sit to stand capacity, um, was also maintained and there were further improvements in mobility and social cognitive capacity. The training dose was sufficient to lead to functional gains that were maintained in the short term. And now we're going to look at a combined approach for longer term and see if we can extend these outcomes. Another recent study that's just commenced, led by Dr. Sarah Reedman, is a um, behavior change approach looking at active start, active future. And this is early behavior change intervention to reduce sedentary behavior and promote physical activity in young children with cerebral palsy. It starts with goal setting, home and community visits, um, and is aims at reducing sedentary time for a more active life. Children are young, between four to seven years of age, um, GMFCS one to five, but for especially three to four, five, um, and they, we hope that we can intervene earlier to reduce sedentary behavior. And this is an eight week tailored program delivered by the physio and OT in the community physical activities and reducing sedentary behavior. And one of the activities that they're really enjoying and we saw earlier is race running, which you can see a lot of enjoyment and that the children are really getting very motivated to be physically active and reduce their sedentary time. So I hope I've shown you a few different options to consider 
in rehabilitation approaches, whether they're activity or participation focused rehabilitation to optimize neuroplasticity by incorporating active goal-directed motor tasks and goal-directed cognitive activities. The interventions are intensive, there's repetition. The challenge is at the just right level, not too hard too easy, or too easy, but incremented. Children are paying close attention. The activities are meaningful and they're conducted in an enriched environment or in context. And the approach now is for parents to be actively involved with coaching and to achieve autonomy. So in five years time for our Centre of Research Excellence, we hope to continue to reduce the rate and severity of cerebral palsy and towards a cure, to accelerate translation from clinical trials into practice to improve health outcomes for children with cerebral palsy, to optimize neuroplasticity through much earlier intervention and use of evidence-based interventions, ensure consumer engagement across our research, and implement these clinical practice guidelines into best practice for all clinicians. So thank you very much. I'd really like to acknowledge the CRE team, the Centre of Research Excellence, Australian Cerebral Palsy Clinical Trials Network, my team in Queensland at the University of Queensland, the Queensland Cerebral Palsy and Rehabilitation Research Centre. And there we have some email addresses and websites. So thank you very much. I think we're now over to questions. Thank you very much, uh, Rosalind Boyd. Uh, you are leading the uh, uh, Australian CP Center of Research Excellence, so I think you are the perfect person uh, to 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 uh, answer many questions. I have one question for you regarding the challenge of intensity. As you know, um, CP children or young children or young adults they have a lot of comorbidities. How to find the right balance? Because there's a lot. To handle with, how to find the right balance with all these aspects and issues to handle? If there yes, are... I think that um, Yannick's habitual approach is very impressive. Um, we had children who were GMFCS4 and GMFCS5 who achieved, and I think you saw one girl in the video, and she was barely able to pull to stand with assistance in the beginning. And it, after quite a lot of training, intensive training, she was walking with a walker, um, a forearm support walker, which was pretty remarkable for her. Um, and you saw children who could not transfer at all, but after two weeks of intensive training could um, transfer from the floor to a bench and to their wheelchair, which would never have been in their parents' wildest dreams. So I think intensity, it's probably going to need to be a boot camp to get children up to a certain level of skill and then work about working into strategies of how we're going to carry that over into the um, everyday activities. There is a lot of um, comorbidities that do impact children. I think there's been a much greater focus, particularly on the early intervention studies, on incorporating cognitive learning games. So the study, the game study, and also the study in India, Leap CP, focused on active learning games, not just um, motor strategies. Mm -hmm. Regarding the hands-off, hands-on, I want to play the advocate of the devil. Uh, um, how do you see that? Because uh, from clinical perspective and clinical experience, I'm a PT also, I think sometimes hands-on is really uh, usable uh, uh, to just bring that child to a next level. So isn't it finding the right balance between hands-on hands off better instead of saying yeah it's all hands off because that sounds like a concept isn't it um yeah i used to think what you thought elegast but i must admit i've been converted watching what those children have achieved and that's why i showed quite a long video of the habit tool camp and you saw some of them from the beginning going through their goals and they sometimes did some shaping where they had part practice of the task, but it was always hands off. Because the problem is that once you put hands on, you're guiding the movement and they're not active. Um, you have to use cues, you have to think about the setup, you have to think about the target. But I think once 
therapists and we had a lot of clinicians who came and spent time with us on the camps and I'm sure that Leanne and Yannick would say that many of these clinicians didn't think it was possible but after two weeks they were very able to do were hands off and I think it's this is um it's I think you know you need to see it in context in something like that in an intensive practice over two weeks mm. and you see how much the children change but it really is getting them to be active yeah, yeah I, I i agree you have to you have to make them active but at the same time you also have some studies here in belgium uh, with the circus camps also regarding uh, um, the gmfc levels two three uh, and we also see very good results oh. but let's move on to the uh, questions uh, q and a's otherwise we, we, we can have this discussion also later on Ross. <laughs> <laughs> but what is the role of competition versus non-competitive practice so that's another uh, question from uh, um, dr what's Arm the role Seal. of competition versus or... non-competitive practice i'm not sure i understand the question to be honest okay um, so yeah. What do you think that means, Elegast? I'm not I think competition sure. is uh, uh, the role of competition versus non-competitive practice. So isn't it uh, regarding sports, uh, perhaps? Uh, oh, you mean in sports? Okay. Um, look, I think that it's, it's been interesting watching the, the little race runner group, um, which we showed your video, and they have um, been doing race running, but they're also part of it. On Saturday, they participate in the sport which are that with other children, they have like race running races. And I think it's highly motivating. I also, when we first started the participate study, I took Sarah on her first weekend to a cerebral palsy soccer group. And they have children from three to 16 in this group. They've got about 30 or 40 children every Saturday who participate at their level. And they're all involved in different, um, sort of not really some competitive, some non-competitive, but a real mixture, but I think some competition can be healthy and very motivating. And I know in our circus camps, we had some wonderful trainers who set up a lot, a lot of challenge for the children. And it's always meet, meet your own challenge, not competing with other children, but competing with your personal best practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Another question I have here regard of uh, Ravje Goodlin, national coordinator from Croatia. How to motivate parents and children to participate, to look what they can do instead of restricting themselves because they have movement difficulties. Yes, and I think that's, um, the participate study was highly successful that Sarah led and I know there'll be a workshop on it. I think it's about thinking what does that child want to learn to do that they can't do, what leisure activities um, and then going and overcoming the barriers that could be very much about the sort of the environment in which they want to play the sport and the other groups of the clinic, children around them, the trainers. And so there might be a lot of social barriers, not just physical barriers. Um, there'll be some things that the child might need to learn about to, to practice some skills, but a lot of the barriers in participation are around overcoming other factors. And I think, um, you know, where there's sport, there's children in sport, there's children integrated in school. I'm not sure in Poland whether children are integrated into normal school or whether they're still mostly in special schools. I can't quite remember from my last visit. Um, maybe Magda could fill us in on that. You there, Magda? Magda? She might be busy. Oh, hello, Magda. Hello. So do, do children in, um, in Poland attend and are they integrated into typical school or are they in, or only in special schools with cerebral palsy? Uh, in Poland, children with polar, uh, cerebral palsy have a um, special, special school, uh, but also uh, a normal school with special class and special uh, teacher which help these children with cerebral palsy. It depends also uh, if uh, with um, cerebral palsy is uh, um, also mental retardation. If it is yeah. mental retardation connected with cerebral palsy, it is, yeah. of course, special school. Uh, 
by uh, schools and special special classes. But uh, a lot of children here in Poland with uh, a normal IQ and without a mental retardation, uh, they are in um, normal school, but with uh, um, one helpful teacher. Hmm. Um, I think that's very similar to Australia, though in the last 10 years, I think children are predominantly um, integrated into normal schools. And I think we encourage children to participate in sports, adapted sports. Um, and we've had a lot of children who've really achieved very high level um, elite um, Olympic sports for Paralympics. And this has been terribly motivating for a lot of young people who could never, would never have achieved that as an able-bodied child but now in adapted sports, it's highly um, motivating. So um, I think, and we've got a few very um, wonderful, iconic um, Paralympians who've been very involved in wheelchair tennis, in wheelchair athletics, which has really motivated a lot of the younger ones to participate. Mm. There's another question though, Ross, uh, uh, regarding uh, muscular hypertonic uh, disorders. So any suggestion for children that also have muscular hypertone, so assume it's spasticity, hence not really moving much the arms. And I suppose this again in uh, the clinical camps or whatever, aside from botulinotoxins. Uh. Mm. So we didn't specifically address spasticity in the camps or before the camps. We have a program of um, intramuscular botulinum toxin. We have other options for spasticity management. We had a range of children, both with um, very marked spasticity. And you saw that girl, very severe girl, who was eventually on the walker, um, who had a lot of spasticity. And um, we did have some children with dystonia. So we incorporate all different children in the camps. It's not any different. Um, and I think the challenge is for the children to be active. And we, you could see her um, working very hard, even just initially to place her feet properly um, with sort of targets mark on the floor to be able to position her feet to prepare for a sit to stand. I mean, she needed a lot of preparatory work before she could actually get up on the walker, but still very possible and still quite able to be done. I think there's too much focus in the past on reducing spasticity and not enough about promoting active movement and promoting um, active um, motor, motor challenge. Yeah. Another question from Chris Jemeling Mailing is intensity is a very important factor to optimize neuroplasticity and you highlight it also in your introduction slides. But in clinical practice and between practices, there's no camps uh, often not reached. What is your advice to increase and is there possibly a role from, for, from parents? Absolutely. And in all our early intervention, we very much focus on the intervention delivered in the home and that the parent is the best guide for the, the baby and that the child, the parent is the best therapist. Um, so it's very much a coaching model, coaching the parent to understand the cues for their baby, to work with their baby, and so that they can have a lot more practice achieved in a home-based program. And also other caregivers. Um, it could be in the preschool. It could be, um, but it's all the different people that work with that child working on goal-directed activities, which could be both motor and cognitive and communication. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm, I'm scrolling through the questions and perhaps a last question given the time, could you discuss the differences in health and developmental outcomes in children with CP in special schools versus inclusive schools? And this is a, yeah, a very interesting question. That's a tough one for me, I think. Um, I think in Australia, all our children mostly are integrated now. So it would be hard for me to describe or make that comparison, but I think I find working with um, a lot of different children over the last 30 years um, in clinical trials, it's wonderful to see the confidence and the competence that children achieve by being part of a peer group from a very early age. So that they, um, we've got a clinical trial that I didn't mention on making friends about peers. So developing their social skills. And these are all different factors that children with brain injury have problems with. But I think there's a lot to be gained from a societal perspective 
for children being integrated early so that their friends that they make, their peers that they have, accept mm. them as they are, not, um, and they integrate them beautifully into the thing. I remember one little boy who was playing soccer, no, playing football with his friends and he had to wear ankle foot orthoses. And the boys on the other team were teasing him about wearing ankle foot orthoses. And he was quite quick in his reply and he said, well, it's a pretty a pity that they don't have ankle foot orthoses for brains because that's what you need. <laughs> His mother was really impressed that he had the confidence and the competence to be able to stand up for himself in amongst his able-bodied peers. Yeah, that's it. That that's the skill of giving a fast uh, response mm. uh, and yeah. the skill is no, of, but, of a yeah. Yeah, but children, I think, need to be integrated. Yeah. I think it's a very important thing for them because then that the, um, able-bodied people are going to accept them and treat them as equals and they're going to learn from them as well. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thank Professor Rosenboyd, thanks a lot. This was an excellent uh, um, presentation. We'll see each other anyway later on during the conference perhaps, but uh, yes, thanks a lot. I look forward to having a hot chocolate in Bruges in the yes, not too distant future. Yes, in, in, in a few years. That's uh, but it's not for <laughs> next year. Then it's first Europe 2021. Thanks a lot, Ross. Bye. Thank you.